Amen. And so God takes all of our abilities and, and uses them and turns them into a gifts. And so today, you know, we started last week talking about the uh, spiritual weapons that God has placed in our lives. And most people will live their whole life and never experience the opportunity, never understand how to operate within the spiritual things that God has given them to operate in to where they can overcome and not just overcome for themselves, but help others overcome. And so last week we talked about this anointing, how, how David was called to be king by Samuel who had taken the horn of oil and anointed him. God led him to him. Out of all David's brothers, he got chosen, right? Doesn't seem fair, does it? <laughs> I had two older brothers, so that was the mindset I had for a lot of my life was it doesn't seem fair. They get to go do. But here's the cool thing is that God has called us all to be anointed. And matter of fact, Jesus said this. He said that He is going to be with the Father so that we could all be comforted and lifted up and built up, that we could all have the same power that, that helped Him it's the same power. It's this Holy Spirit. He said, I leave this comforter to you. Amen? Wow. Well, the interesting thing about the comforter of God, the Holy Spirit of God, is I found out something very interesting in this walk with Him is that sometimes the Holy Spirit will come and comfort you if you're afflicted. So if you have uh, challenges and you're afflicted and you're going through these challenges, the Holy Spirit will come and comfort you. But I also found out that this same Spirit at times will come and it will afflict you if you're too comfortable. And a lot of times in the church we don't want to think about this this way, but I'm here to tell you that this is the way we're going to look at it because in the Word of God there's a reason, and I believe the reason is sometimes we get so comfortable in and through our lives that God has to stir us in such a way that we understand He has a bigger calling Amen. for our life. Amen? And so God's got a calling on your life to look at someone and, said, and tell them that God has even called you. Now, there's this word, this word that is so important to me, this word diligence, and above anything, anything that a school system, anything that anybody could teach my kids, this is the one word that I want my kids to not just understand what it means, this is the one word that I want them to apply in their life. If you can teach someone this one thing, their life will change forever. Okay? And I believe this is a spiritual weapon. I believe it's a, it comes with the anointing and the understanding of our ability and that in our ability and in our inability to do things, we always have God with us. Amen? And this word is called diligence. Look at someone and say diligence. So I'm going to read this scripture, and then we're going to talk about diligence, and we're going to talk about how it affects us and how it affects our inability, but also our ability. Diligence. So in 1 Samuel 16, verses 14 through 23, it says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Saul, Some of Saul's servants said to him, A tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit trouble, uh, troubles you. He will play uh, smoothing music and you will soon be well again. All right, Saul said, find me someone who plays well and bring him here. One of the servants said to Saul, one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is talented, a talented harp player. Not only that, he is a brave warrior, a man of war and has good judgment. He is also a fine looking man, young man. And the Lord is with him. So Saul sent out a messenger to Jesse saying, Send me your son David, the shepherd. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul along with a young goat, a donkey loaded with bread, and a wine, uh, wine skin full of wine. So David went to Saul and began serving him. Saul loved David very much, and David became the armor bearer. Then Saul sent word to Jesse asking, Please let David remain in my service, for I am very pleased with him. And whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubles Saul, David would play the harp. Then Saul would feel much better and the tormenting spirit would go away. And so as we consider this word, you know, last week we talked about how, how David is a shepherd and he's out, he's, he's doing what shepherds do. He's taking care of the sheep and he's tending to the sheep and, and Samuel has come looking to appoint and anoint the new king, but David is in the, the fields taking care of the sheep Samuel says, after he sees all of David's brothers, none of these are to be king. Do you have any more sons? 
and Jesse sends for his son in the field, and David comes, and he's, God tells him this is going to be the, the king, the new king. And just because Samuel anointed him that day didn't make him king in the natural that day, but I'm here to tell you that it made him king in the supernatural. And it said that the power of God, the anointing of God was with David the rest of his days. Amen? Amen. And so what I want to tell you is this, is that diligence, that word diligence is that follow through on the things, even though someone has proclaimed something, even though we know something about ourselves and we don't feel like we're there yet, but we're willing to still be on the journey. Amen? No matter what, no matter how everything seems against me, I know that I know that God had said this about me and I'm going to move forward. Amen? Amen? No matter what, God is in love with you. No matter what anybody says, God is in love with you. No matter how you feel today, no matter what didn't go your way, no matter how broke you are, no matter how rich you are, no matter where you're at, God is in love with you. Amen? Amen. And so if God, the Scripture says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And so what I want, I want you to do is think about this. Unfortunately, many people separate spirituality from skill. And what I'm here to tell you is that skill and spirituality absolutely have to be connected. If you're going to understand God's calling and God's purpose for your life, what, what you need to understand is what God has deposited in you is like a seed. And it will never be developed until you understand that gift is from God. There's a lot of people that go through their day and go through their life and believe God is real, but they don't understand that God has deposited something in them that is real. And God is ready to do something in those things that He's deposited in you, and He's ask, actually asking you to participate in His plan. And so what you are is a gift to you from God, what you are. But what you become is a gift from you to God. What you are has more potential than you can, than you can even dream or imagine. What you are, what you are, what's in you. Okay? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave you with uh, uh, kind of a picture to, to, to really look at and consider. And this is a, actually a seed on the screen. Here's a seed before it is... Uh, broken out of its shell. Every seed has a coat. And every seed has a coat. Every coat must be broken on the seed before it can begin to germinate. Okay? And, and what it is, is God has given us an opportunity. He's given us seeds, actually seeds of opportunity in our life. But every one of those seeds of opportunity has to germinate. And if we, if we don't allow God's power to germinate them, they will never grow and manifest. So if I had a bag of seeds and I laid them up here on the altar, what would happen to them? Nothing. Why not? They're not planted. Every seed has a coat, and that coat serves a purpose. It protects the seed. But it also serves another purpose. It's like a wick to a candle. And every time moisture gets around that wick, that coat... It draws that moisture in. It's trying to draw that moisture into the seed to begin to do something. You see, the coat cannot be broken from the outside. The coat has to be broken on the inside. Your life will never grow from the things you do on the outside. It's got to be an inside job. You're spending so much time focusing on your job. You're spending so much time trying to change them. You're spending so much time trying to change the outside world. And I'm here to tell you spiritually, that will never happen. The only way to grow spiritually is from the inside. This drop of water has to hit the seed. This, it, has to, it has to hit the outer coat, and that coat grabs a hold of it. It's like a wick. It nurtures it, and it takes it to a particular place in the seed which is called a radical. Now, I know we use that word radical, like radical dude. <laughs> They're radical. We use it kind of in a weird way, but this, I'm talking about the radical part of a seed, the radical. And the radical is not the stem. The radical actually becomes the root. And until that drop of water hits that seed and, and, and that coat draws it in like a wick, it does not begin to germinate. And until it begins to germinate, the radical doesn't 
penetrate and drill down into the dirt, into to the ground to get to the minerals, to get to the life source, the life-giving source of that seed, that plant, until it drills down. And so every seed has a hint of life, and every life that's sitting here today has a hint of life. But Jesus came so that we could have full life. He, said he came that we could have a full measure of life. He came that so, so that we could be more than just going through the motions. Can I get an amen? amen? And so I want to read a scripture. It comes from 1 Peter. It's not going to be on the screen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 1 Peter. Chapter 1, verses 22, 23, 21, 22, or actually 22 and 23, chapter 1. And so in the Scripture in 1 Peter it says, Since you have purified your soul in obeying the truth through the Spirit, not through your natural power, but through the Spirit. Everybody say, through the Spirit. Since you have purified your soul in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with pure hearts. In verse 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. You see, God is trying to take us to a place today, I believe in His Word, to a place of today, not just hope, not just an idea. He's trying to take us to a place of more than. Okay? And, and we can sit in church. I know people that have sat in church their whole lives, and they have a hint of life. I mean, like, they're a creation from God. God loves them. Amen? And they believe that there's a creator. They look at the sun, the moon, the stars, but their hint of life is that's about as far as it goes. That every now and then they'll pray, but they're not necessarily believing that God is going to move on their behalf. And God needs us to believe that He is going to move on our behalf. Amen? Amen? As the water begins to hit the outer coat and the coat begins to break from the inside out and comes out and the radical begins to grow and drill down and connect to a life-giving source of mineral and a life-giving source of His living water that will never run dry, then it will begin to grow outside the ground to where you can see. I guarantee if someone has something that you want, if you've ever seen anybody that had something that you wanted, whether it's spiritually or whether it's in the natural, tangibly, they didn't get it by anything you saw. They got it by everything they did behind the scenes. What I'm telling you is that God has something for you to do that not everybody's going to see, just like He had something for David to do that not everybody understood or saw. Which is pretty telling because as we read the Scripture, remember, He's been anointed to be king. In all the world, as the world existed, Saul is tormented, not because he's a bad person, per se, but he's given his heart back over to himself, per se. The, the Saul that once gave his heart to God and was serving God had a heart after God, and then he took back over. Somewhere he got sidetracked, and he became more important than serving God. And so God has afflicted him and trying to get his attention, trying to say, come back to me. Now I want you to think about this. In all the world... Here it is, someone suggests to Saul, why don't you find a harp player to come and play the harp? And that will calm your soul, that will calm your spirit. In all the world, I'm sure there had to be other harp players, but why was it that David, who had already been anointed to be king and the spirit was on him, why was it that David was chosen to go be king? You see, God was working things out that no one else could work out. And God is doing that same thing in your life today. He's working things out that no one else can work out. He is doing things in your life that, that you don't even understand and you may never understand. God is working things out. 
And so as you think about diligence and how that's, how that's fitting to you and how that's fitting to David in his life, he was diligent unto serving, actually, the king playing the harp. But yet the whole time, guess what he knew? I'm going to be king. I'm going to be king. Excellence. You see in Proverbs 18, 16, excellence is giving a gift. It says that giving a gift can open doors. But it also says it gives access to important people. You see, David was given a gift. And he had no idea the doors that it would open. And you are given a gift. And you have no idea the doors that, that God is going to open because of that gift that's placed in you. You have no idea. But you'll find out if you just trust God, if you just seek God, if you will understand that through your life and through His, His power and through His grace, He is trying to work all things together. And so when we are committed to excellence and work diligently to develop the expression of our love to God, our Creator, because He loved us first, when we give back something out of ourselves that He has placed there, amazing things begin to happen. Amen? And I, uh, I'm going to share this story. My wife has shared it. I hope it's okay. I hadn't got her approval yet. But uh, Some of y'all may know this, but uh, my wife grew up on the circus. She grew up on the circus. And she shares this story. She has no idea, so everybody's like, oh, no. Uh, so she shares this story, and it, and it relates because growing up on the circus, her dad was an elephant trainer. And was it 26 elephants, I think? 26 elephants that he had trained? Well, if you, if you can imagine so many elephants, you can also imagine a lot of poop. <laughs> a lot of elephant poop. And from time to time, she, they, they would hire what they called pooper scoopers, right? <laughs> and that's, that's what they would pay them to do, is follow the elephants when they got the place. And, I mean, someone has to do it, Right? <laughs> Every now and then, as a teenager in herself, she would, she would get, find this place to where she would end up causing a little bit of trouble within those pooper scoopers, and they would quit their job, and there would be no one there to scoop the <laughs> stuff. And it's such a profound and amazing story that she shares, because what happened is her dad it finally got frustrated enough, and you know what he did? He put her in charge of scooping the poop. Now, now it's interesting because it's interesting. I believe that we all do this same thing. We all look at people on the job and they're not doing things like us or we're giving them a hard time and we're picking on them. We're not seeing their ability and therefore we give them a hard time. We run them off or we think less of them or we discredit them and guess what happens? We end up having to do the job that they were there to do and therefore not fulfilling the job that we were supposed to do. And I really believe that the church has become somewhat stagnated in the idea and in the plans of God to the very point we're running people away because we're being judgmental and critical and pointing fingers and we're having to do their job when God has purposed us to do this job. I'm telling you, church, you got to take your eyes off them and you got to put them on what's important. You got to focus your eyes and dig down and dig and dwell down and connect to the water, the life giving source that will change you, change this community, change the world when we are connected to that life source. Excellence. If you could just do the thing that God has purposed you to do and do it with excellence, it will honor God and it will honor His church it will, it, and He will be magnified and the church will be growing by leaps and bounds. They will be building more churches in this community. There won't be enough, there won't be enough churches in this community to house the body of Christ that's taking care of the sick, that's taking care of the poor, that's feeding the orphans, that is actually feeding the community, that is actually loving people. Excellence in all things. You see, God is interested more in our 
uh, our, our, how our craftsmanship looks like. And so the Christian shoemaker doesn't have to hang a cross on every shoe he makes. What he has to do is he has to passionately take the shoe and, and maneuver and manufacture and put every stitch in it with a purpose and a plan and, and his excellence, and it will honor God. And the lady that goes home that has to sweep the floor, she doesn't have to sing Christian hymns to honor God. She can just honor God by sweeping the floor and having the right heart set and mindset and saying, I get to do this today because God has given me the ability to do it. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see out here everybody that has the ability. Let me see if I can find someone that doesn't have an ability. No, I, I don't see anyone. Everybody has an ability. Everyone sitting here has an ability to not just change, but to change their environment. You see, God called us, He says that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, and that more than conquerors means not only are we victorious today, but He is ready to help someone else be victorious through your life today. Amen? And so, excellence. So that brings me to the next word, uniqueness. You are unique. You are so unique. In 1 Corinthians 15.10 it says, But whoever I am now, it is all because God poured out His special favor on me, and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not, not I, but God who was working through me by His grace. And so, you know, as you think about your uniqueness, it doesn't mean that we're, that we're radical or weird. It just means you're who you are. And so I want you to think about real, real quick your idiosyncrasies, the things that are different about you, the things that are unique about you, and I want you to understand that it is those very things that we often try to apologize for because we're different in, and th those things that doesn't make sense to us, it is often those things that we need to offer to God and ask Him to show us how it is that we have just those things and how it is that we can honor Him out of them. You see, I think it's those unique things, those idiosyncrasies, those things that people look at and they think, well, that's strange and unusual. You're different. That God wants to work through. Your uniqueness. You see, when it was time for David to fight Goliath, King Saul considered David to be a mighty warrior, not because of his fighting skills. He considered King David to be a mighty warrior because of his skills of playing the harp. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting in all the world that God put David with King, the king, and he had been anointed to be king? Isn't it interesting that God has placed unique people in your life and He's placed you as a unique person in someone's life? Isn't it interesting, and you hadn't even thought about it, what does it mean? And how could it change the world? Because just a time just like this, He has placed us all together at this moment. Isn't it interesting that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and almighty, and He loves us with so much passion that He doesn't apologize for anyone that He's ever created. And everything that He created, He said it was good. And that reminds me that God doesn't mess up on anybody. Can I get an amen? amen. Uniqueness. And that leads me really to this last point, experience. The experience. And so as you thought about the diligence, what is the diligence of the seed? If the seed is on this, what is the diligence? Is there any diligence in the seed in itself as it lays here and it hasn't get, been given the drop of water? What is the diligence in the seed? Huh? It's what? It's going to get radical. <laughs> it's about to. It's just there waiting. It's, it's, it's still in the game. It's still a seed. 
It's not rotten. The diligence has got to cope. Some of you are sitting right here, you're so hard-headed, you can't even let God work in your life. You're hard-headed. See, I saw a few of you look at your people you're sitting by, and you're thinking, ah, oh, it's not me, it's them, right? <laughs> diligence, that hard-headedness, that, that determination, that plan that God has, diligence, when we allow God to come in and we just know at the end of the day, here's the thing, we know that we need a Savior. I talked about sanctifying grace. We, God loved us first. Justifying grace last week is that we receive Jesus. We're justified in Him. Today what I'm talking about is sanctifying grace, digging deep to the well and connecting to the life-giving source. It's maturing in our faith. It's growing up. It's seeing things through. And so Paul, or Paul made this thing. He said, some plant the seed. Some water the seed, some nurture the seed. Which one are you doing? What part are you playing in this? And so, diligence, excellence, uniqueness, and experience, as we see in Romans 3.12, it says, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No, no one can do good, not even one. What, what Paul is saying is that if in and of ourselves, by ourselves, we're nothing. That seed is only one seed. If I had a seed of corn and I had one seed of corn, it's one seed of corn. But what happens is if I, if I plant that seed of corn, it grows into a corn stalk, and then I get several ears of corn. And then that can be multiplied, and then that can be multiplied. And so, in this idea, in and of ourselves, we always have to come back to the fact of we need God. And we need His power. I know some people who have drilled down in one area of their life. They've drilled down, and they got one root. And they got one area of their life spiritually growing, and everything else falling apart. You see, there's more than one root that has to be drilled down. They may have their finances figured out, but their relationships are falling apart. They may have their relationships figured out, but their finances are falling apart, or their health is falling apart. A tree with one root, guess what happens when the wind blows? It doesn't stand. It's going to get blown over. And so we, in Isaiah 64, 6, it says this, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all, all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind taken away. And so uh, he's saying this, the prophet's saying this, Without God, this is who we are. With God, we're, we're so much different. We're beautiful in the sight. We become a bride. And the last scripture that I want to read is from 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. It says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. At the end of the day, when we leave here, we just need to remember that God's grace is sufficient. I'm not perfect. I'm going to make mistakes. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ, that I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities for I am weak then I am strong you see some of us are going to go you know some